Honorable Justice P. Shatashivan, Judge Supreme Court of India, Honorable Justice J. S. Singhvi, Judge Supreme Court of India, Sri K. Parasharan, eminent jurists, former Attorney General of India, Sri L. K. Adwani, senior leader of the country, Sri Harish Salve, managing trustee. NKP Salve Foundation, Pravin Parekh, President Confederation of Indian Bar, Distinguished Honorable Judges of the Supreme Court, High Court, Distinguished Former Judges of the Honorable High Court, Supreme Court, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. It's indeed a privilege for me to be present on this occasion when the Trust has organized to deliver the first NKP Memorial Lecture and they have selected me to deliver that lecture. I consider it as a unique distinction conferred on me. The subject on which three eminent persons spoke, Constitution and Governance, and I think after them, mine will be almost carrying coal to Newcastle's. But still, as a political activist, and being in the administration for quite some time, as in the realm of parliamentary democracy, rate of mortality is very high, but despite that, Somehow I survived for pretty long time. I will share, like to share some of my perceptions on this important topic. Sri NKP Salve I knew personally since the days he entered into fourth Lok Sabha and thereafter he became member of the fifth Lok Sabha and subsequently four consecutive terms in Dutch Sabha from 1978 to 2002. And once he helped me in a way because some of my friends in the cricket world, they tried to transfer the responsibility of being the chairman or president of the cricket control board and I could not persuade them that I have never caught a cricket bat. I can, I have read some literature and I have seen the games but I am not the competent person, so I requested Mr. N.K.P. Salve, and he took that responsibility. In addition to that, I was immensely benefited from his experiences as a member of parliament. We had developed personal friendship over the long years. Now coming to the subject, to my mind, the defining features of any democracy is that it replaces the rule of men by the rule of law and achieves this by creating institutions of governance and process for their functioning. The challenges of governance are always enormous. It is more so in a country like India, where we have 17.5% of the world population with limited amount of resources, only 2.4% of world's land mass and 4.2% of world's water resources. Justice, social, economic and political is the life of any nation, a journey more than a destination. There have been measures of social justice which over the decades have slowly but surely shown results. Abolition of untouchability is one such measure. However, much needs to be done to achieve the greater social justice, particularly gender justice. To achieve social justice requires not mere governance, but the transformation of the social ethos, a recasting of the mindsets, and that is the job, not just of the legislatures, 
or the executives or the courts, but the society as a whole. Political justice is one of the fronts in which we can look back with a degree of satisfaction. The continuing empowerment of the marginalized sections of the society is a testimony to the manner in which the political justice has been successfully attempted to be achieved. The ultimate goal of any democracy in the, is the empowerment of the individual irrespective of his economic, religious, or social standing. This may appear to be an utopian dream for many, but the strength of a system lies in its capacity to ceaselessly work for this accomplishment. We owe ourselves to create a system which access to <clears throat> politics is not limited to the privileged few, but an average Indian also feels empowered enough to contribute. We have achieved this in some measures. Some of our finest public figures have heard humble beginnings and demonstrates how perseverance, determination, ultimately triumph adversity. Economic development is vital to good governance. We cannot distribute the wealth which we do not possess, and therefore production of wealth must necessarily be one of the predominant objectives of state policy. However, this again must be imbued with the principles of equality with which there can be no compromise. An egalitarian society can only be created when growth is inclusive. It is important to ensure that there is justice and equality of opportunity and the state does not create conditions in which privileged few gain at the cost of the multitudes who suffer enduring poverty. A sustainable society can only be based on the principles of egalitarianism. We know when democratic institutions were established in our student days, we are taught democracy has three important ingredients, three Ds, debate, dissension, and discussion. Uh, debate, dissension, and decision. But now we find, of late, interruption of fourth D, that is disruption. Question arises, how to handle it? Simply, it cannot be brushed aside by saying that it should not be done. We don't like it. The ground reality is it is happening not only in the federal legislature, but also in the state legislatures. Therefore, my suggestions would be that there should be a debate, discussions, and we must find out a way out. I was trying to look at that whether in the existing system itself, we can find a remedy. More than often I have seen both as leader of both the houses in Lok Sabha for eight years and in Dad Sabha for six years. There's large number of disputes arise because on the demand of a discussion and sometimes in respect under what particular rule of the house such discussion should take place. To my mind, it is not very difficult to find a solution to this problem. I will give you just two examples. From 1952 onwards, when after the general elections, all the legislative bodies in the country were established, invariably both in the state and the central legislatures, it was incorporated in the rules of the procedure and conduct of business that conduct of the governor will not be discussed. In 1967, a situation arose in which a state government was dismissed by the governor 
because the chief minister and the governor had disputes over an issue, some members defected, wrote letters to the governor, governor made an arithmetical calculation and found out that the chief minister has lost his majority. He advised him to form the, to prove his strength on the floor of this assembly, quite legitimate. Chief Minister pointed out just two days before, with your approval, I have already called the session of the Legislative Assembly. Therefore, there is no need of calling it or advancing it. It can take place on the due date which you have approved and someone has been issued. And ultimately, the Governor decided to dismiss. Parliament wanted to discuss it on 4th December 1967. Raj Sabha bulletin, one will find out. And the then leaders of the Raj Sabha, they found out and way out. And the interpretation given by the chair was, first they did two things. First thing is that they allowed both the government and the private member to move a motion on the same subject. Government motion was that Home Minister made a statement on that issue on the floor of the House and where he supported the conduct of the Governor of the State concerned. And government motion was that let the House endorses the statement made by the Home Minister on that particular issue. And opposition motion was, private members' motion, that this House recommends to the Union Government to dismiss the Governor forthwith. Both the motions were taken together, debated, discussed, and there was no need of disruption of the House. Corruption, misuse of fund, diversions of the fund can be definitely substantially checked we need not have to wait for the report of the Comptroller and Auditor General and thereafter to raise certain issues, which to my mind are also, because Comptroller and Auditor General's job is only to find out the fault. If the financial rules and procedures are strictly followed, CAG has nothing to make comment. CAG's comment arises only as and when there are aberrations. And many of these aberrations can be checked if proper application of mind by the authorized persons, selected persons can do. Therefore, I would like to conclude. I have taken a little longer time than I expected to have. But I would like to conclude by saying that we have received a beautiful constitution which was once regarded by one of the critics of the constitution at the early stage, Sir Anthony Eden, a former Prime Minister of England, that the most significant Magna Carta of socio-economic transformation, Indian constitution is just not merely an instrument or a legal document of governance. It is magnificent Magna Carta of socio-economic transformation. We got this magnificent document from our forefathers to preserve, protect, and to advance it is our responsibility. We, the people of India, who have adopted, enacted, and given to ourselves. I heard a story when American constitution was being drafted it took little longer time, more than a year. A lady, being little impatient, asked one of the members of the drafting committee, Benjamin Franklin, well, doctor, we the women deliver a child in 10 months. More than one year has passed. Well, what have you delivered? Dr. Benjamin Franklin's response was, Madam, we have delivered a republic provided we can keep it. With these words, I conclude, pay my respectful
homage to my old departed friend, Sri N.K.P. Salve. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Jai Hind.